Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It's great to see you all coming into today's smooth scaling webinar. We are here to ask some of the big questions of scaling our businesses. And I'm joined by the one, the only Mr. Paul Archer. Paul has been a good friend of mine for many years now, and he runs the fantastic Jewel Tech. Jewel is an amazing business that focuses on brands and helping them build their advocacy. I'm not going to butcher the Jewel uh, introduction, Paul. I'm going to hand that over to you very shortly. But as more and more people are coming into the room, just to welcome you, Paul. How are you doing today? I'm doing, doing very well. Excited to be here. Thanks for having me. No worries. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. So we're still waiting as more and more people are connecting. We're bang on the hour. But as we get going, Paul, I'd love to just ask you to share with our good audience here how we know each other, because it's been quite quite a few years now, hasn't it? Yeah, I try to remember. I think, I think we met in jail. Was it? It was jail. Yeah, <laughs> just before jail. Just before just jail. Before jail. Oh yeah, we went. So we met. We met back at university when we were but youngins, and we went and organised a trip to to East Africa together to go and work with some of the local communities there, and in my case, go white water kayaking, which was a, it was a hell of a hell of a lot of fun. It was a hell of a lot of fun. And we're talking back now, what was this, 2005, 2000? 2007, 2008, maybe? Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. A lot long enough and ago that we've got a few more grey hairs now since then. But yeah, Paul... Paul for yourself, I look exactly the same, so... You do look the same. Paul's introduced me to whitewater rafting, to the joys of building things in Uganda, and, and for that I'm ever grateful. But since then, Paul, you've gone on to do incredible things. Paul is actually a world record holder for, I think, multiple, but the, the most impressive, perhaps, is the longest black cab meter ride because Paul and a couple of friends actually drove around the world in a black cab and that just gives you a bit of an insight into Paul's character the sorts of things that interest excites and drives him so Paul without further ado we are here to talk about how on earth can you focus and iterate your product market fit while scaling your team whilst keeping the lights on while spinning every other plate but before we begin I'd love just for you to introduce yourself and and also share a little bit about Jewel. What is it? How did it come about? Great. Cool. Thanks. Thanks again for having me. So yeah, my name is Paul Archer. I'm the CEO and founder and one of the founders at Jewel. And so we're a B2B SaaS company that work with some of the biggest brands in the world to help them grow through the advocacy of their most passionate customers and fans. And so well, we're kind of on a mission to make word of mouth and advocacy as easy, as measurable, as predictable, and as scalable as buying an ad, which is a huge opportunity for these brands. Because in the way that we communicate now is that we're like deeply in this sort of social commerce era, every single bit of information we learn about brands, we learn about things. So much of that comes from what people are saying on social media and social at its heart is is a user generated platform, right? Everything is coming from grassroots from real people like us. And so if a brand wants to penetrate that needs to be able to get those people to tell their brand message so that they can actually continue growing in this, then they need to build and nurture relationships with thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of these people to be and nurture them from customers and into fans and from fans into advocates. And so what we do is we work with brands advising them on this, the methodology of brand advocacy marketing, the process of doing it, the relationship, the, the generosity that they need to have for it. So those people will tell everyone they know and support that brand publicly. And the problem is that brands face, particularly if you're at the larger end of this, is managing that and scaling at massive scale across tens of different markets and tens of thousands of different advocates is near on impossible without some complex software. So what Jewel is this enterprise software that plugs into all of their different tools, their e-commerce platform, their CRM platforms to create an interactive layer where brands can create programs and build communities of advocates and set challenges and tasks and activities and reward them incentivize them by giving them early access to products and discounts vip experiences and then also some cash as well if they're able to drive the revenue uh, and yeah and that's what we do amazing and uh, and i know from hearing your journey over the last few years the product is expansive right there's lots of things that people can do all of course focused on this advocacy piece J just to give us a sense what sort of stage is the business at now in terms of team size in terms of the operations look like 
So we've got around 30 people working for us. We are, we work with 50 brands from various different sizes, but many you would have heard of that what the software right now. And yeah, we've been knocking around for a while. This business, the idea for this business came around 2017, but the platform itself only came out in 2020. And I'd say we only really found product market fit, which we're going to talk about in much more detail at the very, well, towards the back end of 2021. Amazing. Okay, so actually just unpicking that, we are obviously here talking about scaling the team and product market fit at the same time. What was happening within the business between the 2017 piece and actually launching the product in 20? When did you say you launched products? Sorry? <laughs> March 2020. Just a great time. Great time for any publicity launch you're going to have. Yeah, we first of all, we're lucky enough to be venture capital backed, which meant that we could invest in getting it right from an R&D perspective, which I understand is a luxury not everyone has. But so that is a caveat to a lot that I've said, not ridiculously, but it just seed capital coming in and not the like a Silicon Valley seed capital. We're like, oh, I've only raised 5 million. No, it was much more modest than that in terms of when we first started out. It basically, we set out on that vision that I outlined in, in terms of trying to figure out a way that brands could grow through these customers. And what we found was it's incredibly hard and it wasn't actually a software solution that would do it. We had a piece of software that we thought would do it. We built it, took it to market. We were completely wrong because it actually it was a much broader problem that we needed to do. So what we did is we teamed up with uh, Jack Crocker. So she was GM of brand and community at Lululemon, who are probably the best community led advocacy led brand in the world and reverse engineered out a lot of what they did as well as got ourselves the opportunity to consult for about a hundred brands where they would, we would go into them and we would be able to, we would come from my background, which previous to that we'd make games. So gamification and viral virality and her background, then people would let us come in and sometimes we charge them. Sometimes we wouldn't, but we were basically able to get as much information as around how they would view these things. We were able to understand the problems that I had within the software. And also from that, we did a lot of study, a lot of studies on the best brands as well as Lululemon. And what we found was that very top tier of brand, the ones who are absolutely the best is that they were built in a different way. They were optimizing for word of mouth, not just for driving someone to sell. They were engineered in that sort of way. And so what we puzzled out was how every brand could be engineered in this way. This became brand advocacy marketing, which we've applied for quite a lot of brands and quite successfully. Then the solution was then abundantly clear that we just needed to build the software that would allow brands to scale the methodology from that. And that's what we started building. And it took a <laughs> took about a year of heads down building, but we knew what the market wanted from the methodology once we got that bit first. And then it was understanding how we can then try and sell that in a way that was meaningful and finding all those other good bits of it. That, that, that's really fascinating. And actually, <clears throat> there's a few, th this model I absolutely love, and there's a few businesses I massively admire in this space where v Venture Builders, as Waybook, is part of a, a Venture Builder studio. So we created multiple businesses based on different needs as well. And there's some people within our space of Venture Building that will only start a software business by creating either an agency or a consultancy because they're saying we want to be providing the value understanding those challenges as soon as we've understood exactly what people need and the point then we create technology around it and at that point how large was your team what did your team make up look like when you were in that kind of early stage oh, we were sub 10 people including developers and ourselves doing the consultancy on that Okay. And with that, the, the kind of growth of the team from that. So once we've understood what the technology is, and now we're building out those operations, how would you say you have adapted your kind of approach to the team? Do you look for different kind of skill sets and characteristics? Or actually, are you still looking for those kind of explorers that can find new ways of doing new things? So I think at the stage we're at now, we're still looking for those innovators, the explorers, and I suspect we will be until there are hundreds of people working for the company. The thing that we need are people who are generalists, who are able to adapt, who are able to like iterate and be creative in, in, in what they do, but also just get the mindset of iteration of of building a startup and get the brands that we want to work with and so everyone who works at Jules is pretty passionate about the end user and want to spend time with them they're excited about the logos that their mum's heard of that they can work with on a day-to-day -day basis and the type of personality type we we hire is quite specific and that uh -huh. is something which we've had to really nurture 
how do you get that into something which scales when it's not just me doing the hiring necessarily like everyone then fits a kind of a criteria to, so that means that they're going to really fit in with our culture amazing i'm going to come back to that the, so just to get it in your mind what exactly do you look for and how have you scaled that kind of recruitment but just heading back into the product market fit so you you said that you launched a product and then actually it probably took three years or so two three years before you feel like you got product market fit let's unpack that a little bit what was that experience like what were the main challenges you found and how did you identify those new opportunities So a certain amount of it was COVID. So that slowed things down and then rapidly accelerated our space in 2021. So it was a blessing and a curse in in many ways. With enterprise mid or mid-market type of product, which is different to a consumer product, is that you have to sign up brands and get them to use it and then adapt, which means the feedback cycle that you get from them is much longer. So compared to when we made apps and games, when you would get it out there and you'd be able to get feedback within a month of their life cycle. And many times the life cycle is 12 months, not counting the sales cycle that will go before that, which would be another three or four or five months in some cases. So it's a lot harder to iterate. And so you have to run on gut shots in many ways and you have to back what you think is right to iterate where the product should go. But that is not, just doing it in isolation when we were in the market consulting we were in the market selling we having conversations with many brands every single day so we knew what they wanted we knew what they were doing on a day-to-day basis so those gut shots were well informed but at the end of the day they weren't purely data-led because i think that if you just worked off the data just worked off the immediate feedback of the operators the product would become incrementally better but with some of the sort of decisions that we made that that was based on a lot of information being assimilated, it was they were binary, they were zero to one decisions. They were exponential that, that we're like, oh, we should build this thing. And that is the thing that people latched on. And that is the thing that kind of put, progressed us a couple of times that would happen. But also there were a couple that went massively wrong. It was being able to know that when it got to market or the concept when you were testing, it just didn't resonate. And then you would just backtrack and you would do something else. Sure, that that makes sense. Can you have any particular examples of where that has happened, where actually you've taken a gut shot? What assumptions was that based on and where that kind of turned out to be something that really enabled you to get to that product market fit? Yeah, so the thing that we've really found traction with is basically allowing, Juul allows a brand to build any kind of advocacy program. And so we initially those advocacy programs were very much focused around getting engagement from your customers, you know, a glorified loyalty program that rewarded people for what they do as well as what they buy. Uh But what we did is was an experiment with one brand to test whether it could be used to manage their social creators. And the software was basically the same. It was like, could we build a community of a different demographic to your customers? They're all customers, but they're the type of customer who is an active creator. It's sub 10% of your customer base. They're a particular type of person. But because we were already building the communities, there was no reason why this wouldn't work. And so it was like, yeah, let's experiment with that. That ended up going quite successfully. And it was the call to be like, yeah, we're doubling down on this. This is now the product that we're selling more than anything else was one of the harder calls to make. And it's something which we didn't take fast enough. And even then it was a hard call to make. And had we done it much faster, it would have accelerated things simply as well. So there are a couple of examples there and there are features as well that we decided to build because it just seemed like the thing that the we needed to build that the industry wanted. But if you'd asked any of the people on a day-to-day basis who were operating the software, it was different because what we were, they would have said different things. They would have said things that make their lives easier, but what we were building were things that would make the brand a lot more money. So the CMO would buy because of the things that we were building, but the operator's life would not be made any easier, which is in fact, potentially be made even harder, which is not necessary, which is really flies counter to a lot of the way when you've got to be iterative with the kind of classic lean startup methodologies is when you're working with enterprise software is that there are two two buyers or two there's a user and there's a buyer and those two are not necessarily the same and they often don't have similar objectives and did you have a route of communication to both both the kind of customer and the consumer within that or, or were you mainly speaking to the people using the platforms I was speaking mainly to the buyers because I was okay. doing all the sales. So I would have the relationships with the person who would 
write the checks and some um, and then sometimes they are the ones who are using the software but actually in, in most mid-market enterprise software if you sell something to a ceo or a cmo the chances are of them ever having a login to the bit of software is relatively slim and so um they are very different mindsets and so the most valuable thing that we and i and the team could do was to spend as much time talking to as many different people as we possibly uh-huh. can to get their feedback, to get their ideas, not necessarily about the way that they use the software, but to actually understand what their day-to-day looks like. So if you take the example of the creator community that we were building, by sitting down and talking to the operator that was managing that, they were talking about all these tasks that they were doing around gifting and around tracking and around conversations and around negotiations. And those things felt very separate. If you looked at what does your day look like from nine mm. to five, what your week look like, where are those tasks? What do you have to do? And it itemize those. You get a feel for what the activities are, what the costs are. Then you can find out other peripheral areas that you can actually support them on. And so that's one thing on the user level and then with a buyer level you're just talking to them about what do they need to achieve what are the objectives what where are the biggest pain points what's going to get them promoted or stop them getting fired and getting the information from that and between the two of those you then have to toss up to figure out what's more important yeah that's that's then good product management right in terms of understanding what do we prioritize where do our resources go to and so it sounds like you found this kind of creating the specific creator communities is almost the kind of big draw that had a lot of resonance with customers how did you know that was the decision to double down in that direction driven by data or was that still led by your intuition yeah so having we did not have product market fit with the first product that we released in 2017 and within the 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 second iteration of it which is this the dual platform in 2020 we didn't really we had a few evangelists who just loved the idea of it they weren't that like they would have bought anything like their software was anything just bought into the idea of brand right. advocacy and that's amazing you need to find those right and that's like the first thing that allows you to then get in and then figure out what the what you have to do and so someone who buys into the vision for that to happen it almost has to be, always be the founder that sells that you can't outsource that sales piece at all because the haptic feedback you get instant from the conversations you get with selling iterates and changes in a way that only a founder who's relatively uniquely in the position of the middle of seeing everything from the feedback from the development developers from the feedback from the operators right the way to the very top of the funnel when they're having live conversations with buyers to understand what their pain points are to be able to use that to to sniff out and find that product market fit and so that was the biggest mistakes i've ever made is when i lost my vision with that and started to scale too soon and so I, I think that um, that role as a as the founder is different to the role of a CEO. And so a CEO is a manager of manager, a, a, a person who can orchestrate people. Some of the best CEOs are founders that they don't necessarily have to be in, in that mm-hmm. sense. But it is impossible to be a CEO of a business that hasn't found product market fit because that is the role of the founder to to sniff that out, to get in there, to have those conversations, to be creative, to iterate. And that is the only thing that matters until you found it, because you can't scale until you've got product market fit and the CEO's role is to scale. And the mistakes that I've made in the past have always been scaling too fast, thinking we got it. Oh, someone wants to give us some money for this thing. Let's go out there and do it. And then, oh, it's not quite there. And then you have to have awkward conversations and it doesn't necessarily work, which meant that I always thought that we were just, we were very close to product market fit. We're really almost there. We just need to do this thing and this feature that's over the line there and we'll be there. And actually, the difference is when you have product market fit, you've got product market fit. <laughs> because- oh, oh, what's, the, what's the feeling? What's the kind of insight? Because people just want to buy it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the if you if it doesn't fly off the shelves um then you haven't got product market fit the market no. doesn't want your product now then there's another stage to this which is sales market fit which i can talk about in a moment but understanding what the product is and the market have a pain point so you have a solution to their pain and it may well be that you're not positioning it, but there is a good chance that you're just not solving the right problems. Because mm. when you sit down with a person, you say, this is what we do. Is that interesting to you? And they go, yes, I do. And then you start 
then in that first call, you start talking about pricing and you start negotiating and all those buying signs are there. That's because you've got product market fit. If you're still relying on the vision sell and you can't just show them a platform and then they go, yeah, I want that, then you probably aren't there yet. And that's yeah. fine. That's not a problem. But what it what I don't think is articulated enough enough to early stage founders is that is the job of being a founder. Like you should minimize any management layers or anything that gets in the way of you having direct relationships with your operators, with your buyers, uh -huh. um, with your team. So you can get as much feedback as you possibly can because that person in the middle uniquely will sniff out product market fit. And that is the only responsibility of a founder until you've got it. Then once you've got it, your job changes. It is then to build the machine to sell it. But if you've got to try and build the machine, you've got to try and build the machine first. And I'm... in fact, actually, there's a good, sorry, uh, the good analogy I always think of this is, if you imagine you're trying to, you're trying to build a car, right, factory, you're trying to build like a Ford, whatever. The very first stage is not to build the factory of the car, it is to build one version of the car that works. Yeah figuring out that you've got to have wheels and an engine and a steering wheel and stick those things together. And you just have to do that once. And the next phase is not then to get a gigafactory. The next phase is to then have a couple of artisans who will build that bespoke in a garage. So you can then churn out not just that first car, but you can churn out three cars, maybe then five cars. And once you've got that, then you're like, okay, then let's replicate that a bit more and a bit more, at which point then you need to think about having people who can specialize, who can be unique people in building the factory to build the cars. But before you get to that point, you've got to figure out how a car works. And if you don't know exactly what that looks like, people far too early scale, particularly when they're able to raise capital, which you know isn't really a problem very many people have going into 2023. <laughs> the, the, that, that kind of that job and that work is often neglected. And I'm smiling along here because the title of this session is, of course, how to iterate your product market fit while scaling your team. And we're potentially getting onto the answer of you can't go backwards. <laughs> and do it. But I think actually there's a really interesting differentiation here between these different gates and stages of us as a business. And I think firstly, even before product market fit, we've got this problem solution fit, right? In terms of actually, do we have resonance with the challenge that you have, the problem you have, the opportunity you have, and what our solution is proposing? So once we've got that problem solution fit, which can actually be tested through conversation and events and MVPs and whatnot, then we've got the product market fit. So that is actually making sure we're delivering that value. But we're also now tapping into this second part of, or the third part that you've alluded to here of this product or this market sales fit or market marketing fit. Tell us about that. And actually, is that a whole, is that a whole different brand, a whole different breed? Or is that just something that comes easier once you've got that product market fit? Yeah. So if you think about that first role, product market fit, a big part of that is ensuring you've got the right product that the market wants and integral to that is being able to articulate that product to the market reasonably well that someone gets it. And I think that means that an, a founder being the initial salesperson is brilliant. And there's a bunch of benchmarks that venture capitalists talk about. It tends to be a founder should do the first million in sales. And now I work in B2B SaaS. Like they, I don't, uh, these are completely different when you're talking about consumer businesses, but for all intensive purposes, we'll stick here because that's the one that I know the best. So that piece there is about, okay, understanding how do I articulate how do I articulate the value proposition in a way that makes you interested in it? And that's okay to do that in initial level there. The bit that then comes after that is how do I train someone else to articulate the value proposition so someone else wants to buy it mm -hmm. and to be able to then scale and start removing the founder from it. And so that is something you, where you're talking about hiring there, you need the what's called the renaissance rep, which is that first sales rep that is like part founder, part sales animal, adaptable, creative. It's a bit of a unicorn role that most people fail to try and do. And often try and hire a very senior VP of sales who, yeah, great. I ran 100 salespeople at Salesforce. And it's just like they are the worst people to hire in many ways. And often I've heard people that get great success with someone who's more junior in their career and things like that. And I'd be very lucky to be working with, with an excellent head of commercial who, who's joined us to doing this thing, Ollie, Ollie Smith. And he's coming from an experience that it's not SaaS based necessarily from agency world, but still just can sell like 
can sell anything. And it's that the ability to innovate, to be able to take what's a pretty bit of a crude model, which is people want to buy it because it does this and it helps them do that, and then turns that into a bit of a scalable machine. This is the going from building one prototype car to building a workshop where you can churn out five cars a year. You've got a bit of automation there. You've got a bit of process that goes into play there to thinking, how do I start to, to build a factory, to build a machine for building these things? And that's that bit there when you have to really understand how do you articulate it? How do you have the materials? You have decks, you have different stages. You, what is it that works for selling your product? And in our case, it's a very consultative led, education led sale because it's quite a new area that people want to be educated around. That works for us. Everyone's going to be different. And so it's understanding those things and then nudging people over to get to their clothes and then knowing how to implement them. So that software sticks, that people use it. And so that come 12 months time when they want to renew or whatever your model is, they are renewing and they are renewing at a higher value than you got them in the first place. So that, that makes perfect sense. But going back to your experience where you said you didn't quite have product market fit till the end of 2021, and then bringing this into your team, how big was your team at the end of 2021? I'd say end of 2021, it was mid 2021 that we did that. That was, we grew from nine people to 20, 20 people or so in 2021. Okay. Um, and was that pre or post product market fit? That was during, if like we had to say that we thought we had better product market fit when we started hiring them. Unfortunately, we found it in the way on the way. And so there's a lot of like operational pieces there that as a team started to bulk out an amazing customer success team and more developers and more operational efficiencies that sit within a large business. And that would be where we were heading for it. We did have a product that people wanted, but what really resonated was a product that people needed. And so we we were able to get lucky and have that kind of pre-chasm sale where just you get these early adopters that just get it. The shift in the mindset, the slight pivot in the product positioning was then we were able to get late adopters. Just everybody wanted to buy it in that that sense there. And that was very beneficial to us. And then we knew that we had a thing that we needed to sell, in which case we then had to start ramping up and getting in front of as many people as we possibly can. And even then 12 months after that, And it's only now that we can really start to scale that operation because you then need case studies. And case studies often take you six to 12 months to at least get it made, get the data, and then you need to get them made and approved. And you could be looking at an 18-month cycle before you have quality case studies that you can use to sell, which means that sometimes it just takes a little bit longer. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense, particularly in in the enterprise cell. And let, let's dive a little bit deeper into the team, and then I'm gonna and then I'm gonna try and play devil's advocate between these two pieces. So, w- when scaling your team, what what would you say have been the main challenges that that you've faced in going from that kind of? Because I guess you've gone from ten to thirty in a relatively short space of time, and I guess even twenty to thirty even even faster. So, what challenges have, have you faced, both as as a CEO, but also then as a business? So I think one of the challenges throughout this was scaling too soon. As we sort of tipped on there is what is in danger is removing me from the situation too early and trying to automate those things that when you hadn't quite found that product market fit, which is a desire, right? It's fun to be managing people, particularly when you're early in your career and you've never done it. It sounds cool. There's all of these grown up things that you're like, yeah, it sounds great. I want to do that. And that's what something very early on start hiring people to try and do the work that they don't want to do. And actually often that work is the most important thing they do. We talk a lot about community building. If you're a consumer brand, we talked to a lot of them. If the CEO just picked up the phone and just called every customer as soon as they bought it, each one of those customers would turn into massive advocates and bring in 10 more customers. It's the most efficient use of their time, yet no one ever does it. Uh, every single time someone responds and posts about them onto Instagram, they get a generic one coming back from the from the brand account at best run by the intern when actually they could have the CEO just saying, DMing them, thank you so much. This is amazing. That person then will post about them every single month. And so it's this kind of work that that is super important that people try and scale too early. And I'm super guilty of that. So that's one thing that I've learned. The other thing, which is about trusting your instinct and trusting your gut when you're hiring. And we spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to quantitatively analyze people to make sure that they tick all the right boxes and they go through various different processes. But if you know what that, that's really important, but at the same time, you should only hire people that you really love. 
And I know that every time we've, I, I've not hired someone who hasn't, I haven't truly thought that I love this person. They are excellent. And I truly am a hell yeah. And it's been like, oh yeah, my CV's great and this and that and all those things. And I spent a lot of time in my brain trying to persuade me that this is a good idea versus other this. Walk off that first interview, an hour in, just like, fucking love them. Pardon my French. That's the thing that just makes you just go, yes, that's it. And I know that person is going to be an amazing hire and they have been amazing hires. And every single time that's happened and every single time my brain has tried to argue that someone will be good mm-hmm. and when they come, it never works out. And it's something which is very hard to cultivate. It's something that's very hard to do. So I can't try and keep track of every time that I've done it. If someone's a hell yeah, like I note down that it's a hell yeah, or at least keep a mental note that I was like, yeah, I walked out of that and said, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And others which were like a little bit harder, I note those ones down and then and then check back a year later, how did that high go? And oh. I think that this is a discipline for people to train themselves into trusting that gut feeling will unlock a lot of doors. And it's infuriating for team members who you're like that everyone looks everything is perfect on paper but you say yeah no they're just well how can i do this you just you can't do it you just have to trust your gut there's no way we can do this using data because you as a founder will know whether you want to hire a person or not and you, how does that doesn't scale beyond hundreds of people but i know that if you look at amazon i think jeff bezos interviewed the first thousand employees maybe 500 just, we'll go for a thousand it's a much better headline yeah <laughs> let's cut that bit out and put that one out as the youtube bit, a bit. i did know that he, he interviewed a, a disproportionate number of them relative to because it's pretty easy to spend it like I think, there you go just to use our kind of like classic silicon valley fanboy analogies the i think that the interview with steve jobs one of the interviews with steve jobs said that he's what's your what's the most important thing is that the most important thing i've got to do is hire the most important thing I've got to do is recruit. And there is nothing more important than building a phenomenal team when you are at the stage to build a team. And I, th- I think that's the point, right? And in terms of when this point that you have about you need to, scaling too soon is difficult. But also if you're doing both, then it's actually quite challenging in order to do both effectively because you do need to get these boots on the ground, but you're also changing what that is. Just going back to something that you were saying around you think that the first hundred people are going to have this need to have this kind of, I'm going to say entrepreneurial flair, but this ability to identify and capitalize and iterate and whatever else. Um, Let me share with you something that that I've come across in in other worlds and just see how that plays out in that model. Um, A friend called Andrew Crump, I think you might know him from Unkillable. um, He has this amazing concept of core versus explore. And this whole world of in our businesses, there's different types of activity to do. There's different things for us to do. Our job as founders are to explore. We need to understand new ways of doing new things, find these opportunities, speak to the customers, look at the products, look at the markets, look at everything else. And we're always constantly exploring new things in New Horizons. And as soon as we identify what has to be done or what can be done and how we do it, we can then codify that to become a core activity. And then we can hire the right people to do those core tasks. Now, that obviously makes sense. And I'm sure every founder watching this kind of is, oh, yeah, I am I am an explorer. You may also have 10, 15 other explorers within the business. But Killable's perspective of this is that you separate the core and the explore so you can drive the business forward whilst operating. Does this work within your world and your perspective, or actually, would you do you want a hundred percent explorers until until either you've explored everything or the chaos gets too much? I love that. I love that approach, and I think that kind of really plays to what I was saying earlier about the explore stage of finding product market fit. That is something that can't be outsourced. And then the next stage is all right. I've made the car. I now need to figure out how to sell this multiple times. That also can't be outsourced. The first X number of sales have to be done by that founder. And then they can take on someone else who can, the Renaissance rep, who can make that a bit more of a scalable machine that then has someone else doing it. But that what they're taking there is, a, okay, we know how to sell it and we know people want to buy it. And this is the value proposition. And this is a one-liner. The like the, the sales process of Salesforce is probably iterating still 25 years after it, it was launched, right? So the, there's still huge amounts to be figured out. 
countless amounts to be figured out in every business, but particularly in this sort of early stage. And so if someone is expecting to have a playbook that's been put in front of them, regardless whether it's sales or it's customer success or whatever, if they're a playbook operator, they are going to struggle massively in a startup environment because those playbooks haven't been written yet. And so Mm -hmm. you need someone to write those, someone to formulate them to try and do it. Now, does that mean that you then can't get someone else to start executing it? Yeah, but the vary the level of fluctuation, the variability as you go from employee one to employee 10 to employee 50 to employee 100 goes from that to this to a little bit of variable like that. And if you go and work at Salesforce now as employee 100,000th or whatever it is, you're still doing a bit of creation, a little bit of iteration. You're doing a little bit. Otherwise, the job would be mind-numbingly dull. So I think it's about understanding that this, the, the kind of person has to go in knowing that they have to create and they want to be enthused about that opportunity mm-hmm. and they have to be able to do that and adapt to it in this situation because you know what you could have just been hired about one thing and that company can suddenly pivot dramatically because the founder has realized that there's a much better opportunity to do that and they have to be like yeah all right cool just gonna throw all that away and we're gonna start going in this direction again because that's actually what they need to do to make that business a success and they have to be cool with that yeah, no, I hear that. A lot of what you're saying, and I'm sure it's very similar to, to everybody else watching either live or on the replay, is that everything you're saying here has so, you can tell there's many stories behind this, many people in your mind. And I'm reflecting on previous team members, current team members that I'm like, oh yeah, that that, that is the energy and the kind of focus that we have within a team. And I think it's just in, interesting to reflect and crystallize on what is important for your type of business at the stage that you are at and make sure you've got the team around it. And tapping on your last point there, how have actually you main, maintained consistency of your service offering, of your products, of your communication with your clients as you've created new value for your clients? Have you, because obviously you've pivoted and iterated a little bit, are you still servicing clients under a different cell and how have you managed that? That's that. Yeah, that's a good question. One of the things I want to add for the other one earlier, what we talked about earlier is the like, it all comes down to hiring really excellent people, because actually they will then if you've got a hundred, you're going up from naught to 100. A lot of those early employees are going to become that they're going to hire their own teams. And those teams are going to hire their own teams. And so by hiring the very best, they will always hire great people, because if they're average, they often can hire less good people and to make themselves look better and then that becomes a cycle a a dreadful cycle to try and make sure you don't fall into sorry let me loop back to that question how do we make sure we maintain the uh, consistency uh, of like previous service and products as you're kind of iterating new obviously we're still talking about a relatively small team so how have you gained status quo as well as pushing forward what we should do what i wish i had done and wish i continue to do is to kill it aggressively kill it once you've found a thing that works kill everything else that doesn't work now this is the hardest thing that a founder will ever have to do or a ceo will have to do it is to get rid of bad people like average people and average ideas now i I don't know if matt Lerner, his his kind of mentality of this is sevens kills businesses which is yeah if someone's someone is a five you get rid of them because they're not good enough and if you have someone who's a an eight or a nine or a ten then they're great But a seven, they're all right. They're not, you don't get rid of them because they're okay. But actually they're they're occupying a seat that a 10 could have. And that 10 will have exponential effect on your business. And so they are the thing that you need to watch out for. And that is true, not just with employees, but within ideas and with offerings. Because if you've got an average offering and you've got a great offering here, if you try and serve both of those, then you split your focus. It's very hard to have someone who's a customer success to be able to serve two different offering. Maybe there's two different sub buyers within it, subtly different, two different value propositions that Mm. may feel similar. It's all in the same mindset, the same, same lead, but until you have enough of a team to be able to be fully in on two different offerings, then you need to just do one, do it really well, because two will be doing both of them badly. Um, mm-hmm. And we've been guilty of this for sure. And so maybe still are in some ways. And But that's the kind of, the, that's the discipline, which I always have huge amounts of admiration for people who are able to really hard to really I, I, down and say no. I, I think there must be something in us human nature that, that kind of limits us from being that ruthless when it matters I think I've told you before but I actually teach on an entrepreneurship masters at UCL and uh, every year I bring new content in and I'm I can't I'm putting more content into these lectures but I just don't want to get rid of other content because I'm 
I'm like, that's still valuable. So I end up having these really long, really busy lectures. And even just on that rudimentary level, it's just difficult to put stuff off. And my other reflection on that is as a small group of businesses, and when we built Waybook a few years ago, we actually built Waybook with the team from Hopper HQ, our planning and scheduling tool. And actually there was a period where Waybook started to take off. Hopper was still a real business. So we found ourselves with one team and two businesses. And yeah, it was actually at that point where we had to, we didn't kill it because it was a real business, but we actually had to hire a whole new team for one of the businesses because otherwise you end up just you're, you're busy and you're doing work and you're moving in the right direction, but it's the opportunity cost of not having that focus and the right drive and the right resource, that, which actually is the thing you're really missing out on. And one of those things that I admire about you, Mike, is that you are you are able to run multiple businesses and actually do that. For me, I really struggle with that because I have to be single-minded and obsessive about one thing because I know that if I get split, then I actually can't give enough to any of them. And in one or the other, depending on my mood at the given time, just gets neglected. And that's not great for anyone. But yeah, I think- it's, a, it's a real thing. It's a real challenge. I think the big ironic or, or the big irony within it, and this isn't that I'm any, there's no secret to it other than just putting my ADHD to good use, perhaps. But the, for the reality is actually, it's not possible if we didn't have such strong documentation, such strong SOPs, such strong systems. Anytime something's done, it's written down. And we always iterate and optimize on what's written down. But it exists from the point that we last started rather than having to, to start from scratch all the time. And the reason why that's ironic is obviously that is the seed of why what Waybook does. So yeah. that, that's why we, we love it so much as a business. Anyway, so we're running a little bit short on time, but what other inflection points would you have, would you say you've had from scaling the business so far? Every time you say something, I'm certainly getting a lot of resonance and I'm sure other people are, but do you have any other inflection points and any kind of lessons you've, you've got from that? So I think that the one of the things that I learned quite early on when I started building businesses is that mm, I was pretty underqualified to do it and that I didn't really have a good idea. I think that's a lot of the things that a lot of people go out there that one of two happens. One is that they're a entrepreneur and they're desperate to start a business regardless of it. And two, they're an entrepreneur and they can't help but start businesses. There is one of those two things that happen. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they are the right person to start a business. And I think this is particularly dangerous, like coming out of university without any worldly experience of industries or the world, things like that. You find a lot of students and early graduates, their businesses are all about student life. And that becomes what it is. And then, but actually, and for me, I was build, building out games and things like that, which was fine, but it wasn't going to set the world on fire. And it was actually only later on after I've been kicking around and was lucky enough to be the first employee at a SaaS company that I learned actually about B2B and that B2B, the B2B business model is just fantastic. It's particularly SaaS. You're getting licenses that w- will agree to someone to buy a thing and then they'll probably be with you in five years time. And yes, they'll probably be paying you two or three times as much as they are initially in that time per month. It's just magic. And you don't, and you, and by that time, you barely have to do anything to keep them happy because they have, you've spent so much time up front really nurturing those relationships and they know how to use the software and that's it. I think that one of the errors that most people making myself included was just thinking, let's get out out there and just do whatever is in my world whether when actually it would be far beneficial if I'd actually got a real job earlier and worked with real businesses and understood real business needs and built solutions for those business needs and in addition also the greatest skill I ever learned from that was learning how to sell big complex deals to big complex organizations is very hard first of all the skill set is one thing to learn the second thing is understanding a big complex organization having not worked in one is very challenging. And so there's like a multiple multiple effect onto there. So I think that was a big inflection point that a lot of people say it's, it's in a different world and earlier on in my career, but I think it's one thing that's worth mentioning. No, that there, there's, there's actually quite a lot in that. One, one of them is the ability to sell in general. And the other one is the ability to understand how organizations work to sell into organizations. I really love your point here about actually not everybody is always a geared up and equipped to, to start a business. I believe everybody can get there But I think actually a lot of people don't go into it with their eyes open. One of my favorite books, and coincidentally, one of the backbones of of the principles within Waybook is E-Myth. I don't know if you've come across E-Myth before. It's this whole concept of 
millions of businesses and entrepreneurs end up with this entrepreneurial myth where they are good at something, are interested in something, can see something, and they're like, you know what, I'm going to start a business around that. So it could be a barista in a coffee shop, and all of a sudden, they're great at making coffee, so they want to run a coffee shop. So they do an amazing job of getting this going, and they they get a place, they get a coffee machine, they put a few signs up. But then actually, as that becomes successful, they realize that, okay, yes, they're good at making coffee, but running a coffee shop isn't around running everything else in terms of built running uh, sorry it isn't just making coffee and it boils down to the principle that within any business you need three different headsets you need the entrepreneur who creates the vision who creates the direction who maps it out and everything you're talking about in terms of the founder role the manager in terms of who actually structures finds puts forces into action and then the technician who actually does the work and the reality is when we get going we have to be all of those three different heads And ultimately, we can then hand off the technician work, we can then eventually hand off the manager work, and then we either end up being the entrepreneur, or we become one of the others. And I think what you're saying there, Paul, is, if anything, I'm just saying there's books to back up your point here, Paul. That's not an an assumption. I love that framework. I think it's something which I've never really thought about the sort of three different steps. And yeah, you're right that when you're an earlier founder, rather than I think that there's probably something else that comes from this and that's being the CEO. And that is uh-huh. the person that is there is the manager. Yeah, you, there is also that is the hybrid between those, which is someone who sets a direction, puts mm-hmm. the right people on the bus. They're not going to drive the bus. And that sort of role, a really interesting evolution. And like for, for me personally, I've found a lot of purpose just in the space itself of becoming a really good professional at being a CEO and understanding my game of how to hire incredible people to, to work with them to help them be at the absolute maximum performance that they can be and as happy and content as, which is a huge part of that yeah. uh, the other side of it is within my industry of b2b SaaS, is it's a machine that has various different different like toggles that you can play around with it's a constantly yeah. moving thing when you optimize different things that machine it's, it's an art and, and if you've never worked in that space you don't quite really understand like quite how beautiful a great SaaS machine can be and I think that when you're in it you're like that's also exciting in the nerdiest of possible ways but something which I get a lot of energy out of I certainly do me, me and James my co-founder and the team we're always looking at one point of data and seeing how that's ricocheted and impacted on other things and like oh I can't tweak this let's do that and Ken has just put in the chat there that he said that this chat I guess it was the product market fit side before are all the ways that he failed his marketing class in college I'm sorry to hear that you failed the marketing class but I hope Hopefully, hopefully now you can go back, go smash it. And I know Kenna, uh, we, we've spoken a few times before, so I know he's he's clearly survived failing his marketing class and is doing really amazing things. So Paul, in our last kind of five five minutes or so, um, the, I did just want to tap back into one, one bit. You said that actually you are now really enjoying this kind of CEO role and working out how to uh, like work with people and get the best out of people what would you say are the kind of fundamentals that you've learned of the activity you do as a ceo that that maximizing your is upon that i think bar setting a vision and being uniquely positioned in the middle of things to see things differently which is often a, a an under underlooked role because actually it's a unique position in an organization in fact everyone's position is unique but the ceo's position is unique in the the lev- the breadth of visibility that they have around different things that will affect different ele- elements if one person's really annoyed oh this isn't working here often you can be like i know but that person's working their ass off to do this and actually that's the trade-off that we have to do or whatever it is right so that that piece there i think is fascinating for me and it's something which which means that sometimes you have to make calls that no one else necessarily gets in the short term and and hopefully in the long run it makes sense that's one thing the next thing is managing and working with great people is what's great i think constantly keeping an eye to people you meet and you meet someone you're just like wow i love them they're great they're impressive in social life and business someone's sold to you someone's a client whatever it is you're like "Mm, okay just keeping a constant rolodex of great talent and maintaining those relationships because often i found when i was earlier in the process of doing this to meet people who are incredible but i couldn't afford them and that's fine and i didn't have a role for them because they were too senior or anything like that but if you're successful your business gradually gets bigger and you get more and more senior people in and those are some of the best hires that we've ever made of people i've met 
quite a while previous to then eventually they came in and so mm-hmm. that that's one that's another part of it with you constantly be recruiting and then the other one is to allow and to empower those people to be able to run the business in the way that works for them to be a sounding board not the micromanager and now this is something which is a, a hard thing for founders to do because as a founder you're in the weeds you're constantly micromanaging you have to micromanage to find that product market fit but as soon as you have that and then you're then thinking about scaling it and then scaling is a very different operation and it's a very different mindset because you're optimizing for growth you're optimizing for what comes next rather than optimizing for finding the right thing and then that means that you cannot manage it. In fact, you have to be as, as redundant as you possibly can be, which is one of the hardest things that any founders who become CEOs will ever find. And it's something which I'm trying to learn. And I'm fortunate enough that I've got an incredible leadership team, an incredible team in general of, of great people who are able to go off and push the business and create their own different optimized pathways within it because they are taking an interest in it i can't tell them how to do that all i can be is a sounding board to help them feed it and just to tell them constantly where that long-term mission is where that direction we're going to go is the kind of the analogy i always think of it's like a bus it's my job to say we're driving this bus to newcastle and to tell people continuously about how great newcastle is going to be we're going to get skittles vodkas or whatever it is if anyone ever (laughs) been on an eye but then my job is then to put the people on the bus like great people into that and then that's it i'm not going to drive the bus and i'm not going to navigate the bus so whether they want to take the m1 and the m6 or whatever it is or go cross country across wales they can make those calls Mm -hmm. i can be like are you sure that's a good idea to go there via ireland or whatever maybe not and then they'll be like yeah oh yeah you're right no i never thought about that you're right let me do another thing but that's their decision that's their role to to be able to do those and it's not mine and the more I remember that, the better I am at my job. And when I forget that, it's when I'm shit at my job. And that's the long and short of it. Fascinating. Amazing stuff. Are you up for a couple of quick fire questions, Paul? Shoot. Um, what would you say is the smallest thing? And let's say mildly quick fire. So it doesn't have to be one word. And what would you say is the smallest thing that's made the biggest difference when scaling your business? probably reading the quick fire questions before so i could come up with a better answer than have to do it on my my feet that would have been not doing that would have been a big difference that sounds like a cheat to me paul that That is a cheat yeah i realize it i think that the thing the smallest things that have made pivotal differences is just getting on having that one conversation with someone and be i like you I think this is very interesting from from an investment perspective, if anyone's going to fundraise is this is a partner who's on the other side of it. On the other side of the table, you just make a call. Yeah, our job is it's two way thing, just in the same way that when you're interviewing someone, you are selling the role as much as they are being interviewed for the role. It's a two way piece. And so just having that ability to trust that gut, as we talked about earlier. Mm. And so when you sit down and you're trying to sell someone, just be like, yeah, let's just be friends. And if we can be friends, it would be authentic we have an authentic conversation, then people buy from people they trust. And if you're being authentic, then they trust you. And that's the same with every single stage, whether you're hiring someone, you're selling something, whether recruiting is just being able to trust that little part in your brain, which is like, let's just get rid of the bullshit. Let's just be honest, trust your gut with those people and go from there. That right. was not the whole thing though, was it? That was not, not really answering your question. That, no, it does. And, and, and it really pulls back into on a lot of the threads that we said before. And if you were starting again, what would be the non-negotiable foundations you'd build into the business? Non-negotiable foundations would be clear vision for the buyer and an understanding who those are before building anything. And that is what we got wrong at the beginning and what we got right the second time. And so before build, building a single thing, having spent a huge amount of time with customers, talking to them, understanding their pain points and outlining it, is this, would this be helpful? Like literally this thing, if we had this, how would you make this better? Not Is this good? Yes, this is good. I know you guys talk about the mum test quite a lot, but it's just thinking of this, what would make this better? And that's a different question to is, would you like this? It's just, yeah, I like that, but maybe it could be this. Maybe it could be this. And so constantly getting that feedback loop and then building it, which is the hardest part. Makes a lot of sense. Two very last quick ones. What would you, what tools would you say have helped you whilst, whilst scaling? Um, so beyond Waybook, which is very helpful, which we actually do use at Jewel for our onboarding. We have been remote since before COVID. And so the whole sort of suite of G Suite, which which allows us to do that. And I think that there's a 
yeah no i think that's that's very hard to just put it down just like the amount of conversations and the ability to iterate on documents and things like that through the google suite has been integral to our entire organization and then other things that when you're early stage keeping you don't need a complex crm i think we use pipe drive which is cheap like 50 quid or something like that ahead and then and then use mixmax to to do various different targeting because to find product market fit is the same as to sell like you have to get in front of people so using those tools to automate your, your emails and to get out to people and say hey would you like this do you want to have a conversation here's what i can offer you this is my what i have on offer and, and that will save you a huge amount of time love it the final one and i know we're a couple of minutes over but it would be remiss of me to not ask this question when we've got the world's foremost expert in brand advocacy but as an expert in advocacy what what would you say are the kind of one or two key things that brands should be doing to promote advocacy within their within their brand remarkably it's not too dissimilar to what i've been talking about so what most brands really focus on is how do they get the person to buy and they don't think about what happens after that so that person will tell someone else and so the key thing is to build a relationship talk to a person and just be like okay why did you buy oh i saw it on a thing okay why did you buy why did you buy why did you buy get down to that why and often what you'll find is the vast majority of sales come because someone has said something initially where did you first hear about us and so that first conversation of where all right mike told me about it I'm like, okay cool what did he say? Oh, I can't remember. Yeah, just ballpark. What was it? What was it? What were you talking about? Were you asking him a, a thing? like, oh, I think it might have been this and that bit there. And it, then it's, oh, and how did he position it? What, how would it help you? Then what they say happens there. That is the most valuable thing that any brand could ever know, any business can know. And to take that little nugget, that secondhand story, that word of mouth story, and to make, and to get that, ask enough people. And if you hear the same thing every time, that is your value proposition. Mm. And that is the thing you need to be focusing on ensuring you tell people because then other people will take that and then they'll tell other people. And once they do that, you get exponential growth through advocacy. So that's the first one. So ask those conversations in the process of doing that, deeply know that person, understand their pains and their wants, spend as much time with them as you possibly can and nurture and play to their egos and respond to them. And then the final bit that then comes after that, which is when you're trying to get someone to advocate for you, you can't really, you can't make someone do that. You have to earn the right to do it, which means Mm -hmm. that you needed to provide them with a remarkable customer experience, so much so that they feel compelled to remark upon it, literally. And then everything they do, you should incentivize and recognize and reward them for everything that they do. And then from there, you'll start to build a little bit of a machine. And all of this has to happen manually at first. An early stage business, it has to be manually. You don't need to scale it until you are at 7 million or more if you're a consumer business, which is something that blows people away. We literally scale this for a living. You've got to do it manually. You've got to get there in the trenches and really build an army of advocates, build a community of advocates um, Mm -hmm. the hard way. Amazing. What, how lovely put there. And you're right, it does actually really link into a lot of everything else you've said. So Paul and everyone, that really brings us to the end of today's Smooth Scaling webinar. Thank you so much for all of your time and insight. I know actually genuinely I've, my, my so many thoughts and experiences have flooded back into my mind hearing you and I'm like, yes, I have thought that I have felt that, but I didn't quite articulate it in that way. Um, some of the core takeaways that I'll personally take is just this whole concept of not scaling too quickly. And we hear this all the time. And there's actually a book called Sc- Nail It Then Scale It. I don't know if you've come across <laughs> it. And it's this whole concept that the that there was research that showed that about 70% of kind of startups failed because of premature scaling and losing those resources in the wrong direction. Paul's articulated that in an amazing way and actually focused on what product market fit feels like and how to get there and whatever else. So yeah, focusing on nailing it before we're scaling it. Um, Well, we seem to have really pulled a lot on this kind of human connection and both in terms of sales, in terms of recruitment, in terms of management, in terms of advocacy, and actually building these human connections that you leverage your gut and your intuition to know that they're the right people in the right place. I'm keen to do this in two years time and we can work out how you can codify and scale that even more but for now that is an amazing learning i'll certainly bear in mind and the other thing that sits in my mind personally is just i'm going to call it killing averageness or killing (laughs) Um, 
we spoke about talent, but I don't want to say kill average people because that is not the message that we're trying to say here, but killing average products and service lines and offerings and whatever else in order to get that focus, in order to get to that product market fit and continue the scaling. The importance of that was not lost in your message there. And I thank you so much for sharing it with us. Like I really enjoyed it. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. We've had a few comments. We will continue on in the chat a little bit afterwards. Ken has just said that he's been through a lot of different industries. Relationships are key. So agreeing with you there, Paul. Nothing complicated about it. And your word is bound and has to be. But communicating those key drivers of the business is always the challenge. And he said that's why he's a fan of Waybook. Thanks so much, Kenna. If there's anything else you'd like to speak to us about, Paul is your man. The building brand advocacy you can look him up he's linked in the show notes here and also you can find him online we'll send all of his contact details around if you ever want to talk about scaling your business building your knowledge your systems your processes to make sure that you can spend more time exploring in that founder activity of finding the right customers finding the new ways of doing new things whilst keeping everybody else in your team on the same page as you continue to grow you know where we are we are waybook it's been an absolute pleasure thank you so much paul and thank you everybody else we look forward to seeing you all next time bye-bye now thanks for coming on guys cheers